Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jessica Duganzik, the Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. We are honored to be joined today by Ambassador Philippe Etienne, France's Ambassador to the United States. We'd also like to give a special thank you to the Consul General of France in Los Angeles, Julie Duhop-Bedos, who helped to make today's event possible and is joining us in the audience. Our moderator today is Kimberly Marteau Emerson, a lawyer, advocate, and civil, civic leader in the fields of public service, international affairs, and social justice. She is a tried and true Francophile, having lived in Paris as a junior in college and Aix-en-Provence, where she did a master's degree in French private law. She serves on the Global Board of Directors for Human Rights Watch, as well as several transatlantic boards. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and splits her time between Los Angeles and Berlin. Today's conversation will be on the record and you can watch a replay of the talk on our YouTube channel. We'll be taking your questions in about 30 to 35 minutes. You can submit your questions by entering them on the question section of the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and I'll get to as many of those as I can today. Kimberly, thank you so much uh, for joining us and leading today's conversation. I'll turn this over to you and I'll join with some audience questions soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for hosting this conversation today. Welcome, everyone. Je suis ravie d'être ici aujourd'hui pour discuter avec l'ambassadeur Etienne. Une grande salutation au Consul General Duoli Duol-Bedos. Um, okay, that's all the French you're going to get from me. Um, Ambassador Etienne is both a personal and professional friend. He previously held numerous posts within the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, which is the equivalent of the U.S. State Department, including as Ambassador France to Romania, Director of the Cabinet of the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Permanent Representative of France to the European Union, and most recently, Diplomatic Advisor to the President, which is the same thing as our National Security Advisor in the US government. Just before this last post, Ambassador Etienne was Ambassador of France to Germany, which is where we met about seven years ago when my husband, John, served as US Ambassador there. And John is also joining us in the audience today. The ambassador is uh, an expert on the European Union and com continental Europe and has held posts in Moscow and in a nod to diplomatic alliteration, has held posts in Belgrade, Bucharest, Bonn, Berlin, and Brussels. In addition to his native French, Ambassador Etienne speaks English, German, Spanish, Russian, and Romanian. On the off chance you might be worried the ambassador should present a more robust resume, let me add that he's also an officer of the Legion of Honor and a commander of the National Order of Merit. We are extremely honored to be able to be in conversation with you today, Ambassador Etienne, bienvenue. So, Thanks. <laughs> absolutely, bienvenue and uh, let's start. We've got a lot to talk about. There's so much going on. Lots going on in France, lots going on in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, and in the United States. But before we get to our policy discussion, let me start with a perhaps a more fun question. Since the World Affairs Council and Town Hall are situated in Los Angeles, let's begin our conversation by talking about the relationship between France and California. There do seem to be a lot of parallels and a little bit of a love affair, no? The weather in San Francisco reminds of Paris. LA feels like the south of France. Cannes and Beverly Hills are sister cities. Both LA and Paris are frenzied over fashion and food, and California and France equally celebrate their wine, especially their wine. The French have the Cannes Film Festival. LA has the Oscars. The French have given us Chanel, Truffles, and Brigitte Bardot. We Californians have given France Euro Disney, Fish Tacos, and Angelina Jolie. How do you see this relationship? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kimberly. It's uh, such a happiness to see you again. And hello to John and uh, 
uh, hello, good afternoon, good morning to everybody here. And thank you. It's uh, such a privilege to be to be invited by the Los Angeles uh, World Affairs Council and Town Hall and uh, to be in this conversation with you. And you have uh, started with a very, not, not only a, a pleasant question, but a very important question because California is such a, such important uh, uh, and uh, we are, yeah, you could have quoted also the fact that Los Angeles and uh, Paris and Los Angeles will host uh, one after the other, the Olympic games uh, in 2024 and 2028 and that it was maybe the first time that two cities uh, agreed to uh, for such a, a negotiation covering two, two, the two uh, two succeed two uh, two succeeding um, Olympic Games. So, uh, and we, we I would add also the climate. I would add the common cause for the climate. We are so grateful to California, to the cities in California, to the people of California. You know what it is. Uh, what what does what, what it means to 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 you know what it is climate change and uh, you know what it means to have the consequences and uh, we are very grateful to you because during the four last year California and uh, its cities were uh, in the Paris Accord and have uh, uh, been a, a great allies for this uh, a common cause. Uh, France in California it is also the third largest uh, foreign investor more or less 100,000 jobs in California created by French investors. All great companies are there, but also many, many French uh, people, our Consul General in Los Angeles know that. Um, we have uh, tens of thousands of young, bright French people coming both to, uh, to, to Silicon Valley, but also to Los Angeles, to Hollywood, working for your um, uh, tech companies. And uh, we are very proud of that. And when I visit California, and I will visit it again, uh, now it is possible to travel again. Yes. I, can, I can say I am proud of um, the, the young French uh, compatriots I see, young or not young, by the way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they play a very important role uh, in your ecosystem. So all of this creates a true complicity, a true friendship uh, between um, California and France. And we are very, very uh, proud of that. Oh, wonderful. And and please do let us know when you're coming out here. And maybe by then we can actually do a live event with the World Affairs Council, which would also be kind of exciting. So, um, all right, well, let me get to some of the more serious uh, issues that uh, France is confronting and uh, right now. And I think that the uh, elephant in the room is, of course, the ongoing violence and conflict in Palestine and Israel at this moment. Over 200 Palestinians have been killed, over 1,600 wounded and 58,000 displaced. Um, thousands of rockets are raining down on Israel from uh, the Gaza Strip. So I, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, in the past, the French government has been a very active player vis-a-vis um, -vis this conflict in an effort to find a two-state solution and pursue a peace process. But unfortunately, these efforts have really not brought a lot of uh, outcomes at this point. So I'd love for you to talk about where France is today just on that general issue and does France have a big picture idea for how to get get out of this mess and then more specifically um, and this is probably related to what I just asked you is talk about uh, what's going on at the UN what's the evolving dynamic at the Security Council on this thank you well thank you Kim Sam Kimberly uh, of course it is a, a very important question right now because we all see what what's happening and all those uh, dead, uh, all, all those casualties, including uh, civilians and children, even uh, on both sides. And uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a tragedy and we want to, 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 to see it uh, stop as soon as possible. And we all try to, to make big efforts. You mentioned that France traditionally is very uh, uh, wants to be an active player. We we are still there today. We we had pr the Egyptian president in Paris uh, on Monday. Uh, we had a summit on uh, on Sudan where he, he attended, and uh, uh, we used this opportunity to have a trilateral discussion between uh, President Macron, pres the President of Egypt, and the King of Jordan. Egypt and Jordan, being two key uh, moderate Arab uh, Arab states, 
who have uh, signed the first ones have to have signed treaties with Israel and Egypt being obviously a, a very essential uh, traditionally uh, here now again essential essential actor to try to 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 bring uh, a ceasefire uh, um, so we we work with those uh, countries. We work also very much uh, with the U.S. Of course, we have a close coordination, and uh, our two objectives are, um, uh, like many many other countries, like the U.S., to 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 obtain uh, an immediate ceasefire and to have a, a um, uh, access for humanitarian uh, relief um, to 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 the populations. And indeed, we, we we were very active as permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, and we um, we said we are ready to to bring um, a text to the UNSC for consideration with these two goals: to 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 appeal to an immediate ceasefire and to uh, provide for a real access for humanitarian aid and and relief. So we are there and we are very active and we will do everything we can. We had also a foreign ministers meeting of the European Union yesterday, who nearly unanimously agreed on the same objectives. And we uh, we will not uh, stop uh, uh, acting in those directions. And now, then after, after that, of course, there is a broader question you asked about a political solution. I think that we are seeing now is uh, unfortunately uh, a new evidence that we we must not stop working for um, a two-state solution. We know it is uh, it is com complicated, probably more and more complicated with the evolution in the last years. But it is absolutely necessary to to fight for this because there is no there is no other solution. So we we have engaged this work also with other countries, again Egypt and Jordan, but also Germany and other European countries. We have restarted this cooperation between European countries and moderate Arab countries in general. To, to to build a strong base to uh, to be helpful for Israel for the Palestinians to to restart a push of course the US will be uh, an essential as usual uh, an essential actor in this respect so i'm going to um when we get when we have we get to q and a i'm sure there's some people in the audience who will want to kind of do some follow ons there and and press on pieces of that but um in the interest of covering a few issues, um, let me let me move on. And this is a little bit of a follow on. You were talking about the role that uh, Egypt is playing in the um, trying to bring this to a ceasefire, but just in general, France's relationship with Egypt. And now I'm gonna toss on my human rights hat and ask you a little bit of a challenging question about this, because of course, President Macron has portrayed himself as carrying the mantle of human rights, um, this has been a big part of his 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 whole uh, persona since he became um, president. But at the same time, we've seen France uh, sell jets and arms um, to Egypt, including 30 fighter jets recently. And um, you know, despite serious abuses and war crimes that have been committed by the Egyptian army during operations in the North Sinai and the use of French equipment in the bloody repression of demonstrations by Egyptian security forces in recent years. Um, under President al-Sisi, Egypt's been enduring the worst crackdown on basic and fundamental rights in decades. So there's that. And then also France continues arms sales to Saudi Arabia, which is you know, culpable for thousands of civilian deaths in the coalition war in Yemen. And certainly France doesn't want to be seen as complicit in these high levels of human rights abuses. So I'm just wondering how the French government justifies these sales in light of its human rights aspirations, its peace efforts, et cetera. Well, um, uh, I was, uh, it happens I was, uh, uh, with President Macron when he visited Egypt. And I remember when he publicly in Egypt raised this question uh, of uh, human rights in Egypt, as he does in uh, all countries uh, with which we, we have uh, relations. And uh, I remember how also we, we met with uh, uh, civil society representatives and civil rights uh, defenders. We do this uh, all, all over the place and the, the, the we have the same 
I'm sure, like in the US, the same kind of uh, monitoring of uh, sales of arms uh, to be to be sure that they are not used for internal repression. Of course, we are very very careful about this. So we uh, we do we do this uh, with uh, all uh, all partner countries. Uh, and we finally we engage very much also in uh, in, in in the solution of uh, conflicts in the settlement of uh, conflicts which uh, are not only the one uh, in Gaza right now but other others in the Middle East and since you mentioned uh, the Arabic Peninsula we uh, we are completely also committed to uh, finding a peace settlement in in uh, in Yemen. And the uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia were also the object of great discussions in France, also in, in, in our parliament, uh, and uh, as I said, of uh, very strict uh, regulations and limitations. And so we, we don't uh, do uh, things we, we shouldn't do in this respect. I, know, I do know that there's been uh, evidence of those arms being used, um, unfortunately, even if you had put down restrictions, um, being used by both Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So, um, you know, again, it might not might not be what you requested, but you you know, it's important to know that that's that's how they are being used. Um, let me and, let me move and, on to. Go ahead. Did you want to? And then it has to be investigated, of course, uh, we, and we do that everything. Every time we we get information, we we try to confirm it and to investigate and to draw consequences from that. And the, the civil societies, and you do that as Human Rights Watch very well, has obviously a very important role to to play. We and we we discuss with, uh, with it, 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 it's 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 also our duty or responsibility, but I consider it also as a, a good thing and opportunity to to have this role by your organization and others. And I, I will say that the president, the executive director of Human Rights Watch, has been invited in to meet with President Macron um, every. 18 months or so to sit down and talk about these issues. And, and that's really laudatory. Um, but let me switch now to an issue that I know concerns many in our audience, and that's climate change. You mentioned it in your opening about um, you know, California's uh, great uh, investment in um, trying to reduce gas emissions and, and be part of the accords. Um, of course, France, which brokered the accords in Paris, has committed to reducing greenhouse gases by 40% by 2030 and set itself a target of being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, I'd love to have you talk about this recent case in the administrative court where four NGOs, including Greenpeace and Oxfam, accused the government of insufficient policy actions that are needed to tackle climate change and said that greenhouse gas emissions under the current government dropped at a pace that was twice as slow as the trajectories foreseen under the law. And the court actually in the lawsuit found the government guilty of moral damage because its failures, as the court said, undermine the collective interests defended by each of the applicant associations. So a further investigation has been ordered and your environmental minister has actually admitted that, that it's true. Um, that that France hasn't, uh, you know, uh, stayed in line with its commitments. But um, you know, what do you have to do to 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 carry out your responsibilities under the Climate Accord? You're obviously seen as a huge national leader um, because of just how they were founded there. Well, first, internationally, I can tell you, being uh, having been the, the G7 and G20 ship of President Macron during two years, without our country, without France. We, uh, it would have been very difficult to to hold together. It was difficult, but we did it. We succeeded to hold, to hold together the international community and to isolate the U U.S. under President Trump. And I remember nights, uh, really, uh, literally nights spent forcing all the delegations to stay awake to force uh, uh, negotiations where we could be 19 against one to underline that the uh, Paris Climate Accord are irreversible. And we we launched, uh, our president launched the so-called One Planet Summit series of meetings also to give, to give flesh to this because obviously to sign an agreement is not enough. You have to, 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 to implement it. And the Paris Accord said, 
that the ambition must be raised every two, three years by each nation. But we must also create uh, actions, the conditions of actions. We must uh, increase climate finance, also private climate finance. We have uh, launched a group of sovereign funds, well, sovereign funds. We have launched groups of uh, uh, asset managers. Uh, we have um, promoted what you call the GCFT, which is a, a disclosure and transparency standard for green investments. Uh, we have done uh, a lot more on the field of the fight against the loss of biodiversity and climate change as international actor. And I think this is recognized. And I thank you also, Kimberley, for having said it. But you're right, it's not good enough to, to, do, to be very active uh, internationally if you are not yourself active internally because the paris climate accord i repeat it is a uh, is a construction a completely new construction which works which will limit to 1.5 degrees the global warming only if each and every member of state of this international community takes it seriously and uh, increases uh, progressively its own uh, climate ambition and uh, goals and improves its goals and its policies so that we together reach this uh, goal of 1.5 uh, degrees maximum. Uh, and uh, we, we must do this. And I, I think that, frankly, as not, not only France, but as European Union, we were front runners. And if, just look at the, the emissions per inhabitant. Uh, France and in Europe and Europe in general are must, much, much below the United States and not to speak about other big countries like China. And we do we do every everything to reach this uh, by increasing our commitments. And last last December, the European Union leaders decided finally all of them, including Poland and some others, which were reluctant at the beginning, to subscribe to the 2050 carbon neutrality objective, but also to increase our commitments to uh, and to increase the commitment to uh, to lower the emissions. Uh, from minus 40 to minus 55 uh, percent in 2030. To, to, to do this, to make this possible, we must take decisions, we must take actions, we must pass legislations, but we must also um, organize concretely our policy. Um, uh, and we, we try to do that. And I find that it is really sound that uh, we have uh, in the civil society, and especially among our young generations, we had, we have very, last Sunday, in Par I was in Paris, and um, uh, not, uh, not this Sunday, but eight, eight days ago, we had a demonstration, you know, with, uh, with uh, young people, including, it is a secret, don't tell my government that, including one daughter. <laughs> <laughs> They demonstrated because they said that this law in Parliament is not ambitious enough, this law which we which have now before our Parliament. And it's good, it's good. And uh, But the, the objectives we had fixed for French emissions in the very last years, we have, we have, uh, uh, we have reached the level we had uh, committed to. Uh, but to reach the goal in 2030 is really very, very ambitious. So we decided to close our last uh, coal fire thermal plants uh, next year, which is still difficult, even if we have much less than in some other countries, Poland, Germany, US, it's still a sacrifice for the regions, uh, which need then fair transitions, environmental justice policies also. We, we, have, we have been doing that and a lot of other things we have a uh, prohibited uh, exploration of uh, shale gas and oil or we have uh, uh, forbidden some uh, uh, prospection of some uh, minerals in, in in our territories including overseas we have done many many things but it's uh, it's really important to to use the recovery uh, post covid recovery to reorient it what you call here build back better to reorient it, our uh, our public policy. We have a huge plan for hydrogen, for instance, for green hydrogen in public transports or in. A, uh, we we have uh, um, increased enormously our credits for uh, housing for clean transport, electromobility has really uh, started to develop in the during the last year in France. There is a, a real. Uh, we say envol, takeoff of uh, the, the proportion of electric cars. So 
we we do we we have forbidden some flight connections between two cities when there is a better high speed train uh, or not a better but a, a, a good high speed uh, connection between the two cities and typically on this last example we have started to act i don't i don't know whether any countries uh, in european countries or in the us has taken measures to in, to prevent flight connections between two cities which are connected by high speed but typically your young our young generation these ngos have said it is not enough you must be more ambitious you must uh, forbid all internal flights connections be between fr because france is a smaller country and france has developed high speed train and you can go from any city to any other city with high speed so we have this type of re of, uh, of discussions and i find it okay completely fair and uh, then the government has to act and uh, it acts it is acting but maybe not as as far as uh, uh, those uh, people would like to go because they are they, they are ambitious and they are right to be ambitious so there is always this balance this conversation between policy and um, and society and it, I think of course it yeah no no of course and thank you for that that super full answer and um it does sound like the government is trying to do a lot of different things, both domestically and internationally. I, I would add a follow. I would ask a follow-on question because, but mm -hmm. I, I think we should move to a couple of different topics. We only have about ten minutes left between the two of us before we go. To, and I have so many good questions, um, <laughs> but, um, but I did want to just, you know, raise the fact that the Gilets Jaunes which was you know the yellow the yellow vests which really started protesting over hiking fuel taxes which mm. i think was in part an effort um towards uh climate change uh reduction of emissions and sustainability so your populace your public is um you know ready to protest on one hand do more and on the other hand don't charge us so i i mean so maybe someone in the audience will want to ask about that i i would love to move to another question but i did want to kind of raise that the, the contradictions that are inherent in trying to change public policy um so uh, a lot of national security pundits political leaders and nato supporters in the united states and i should add here perhaps also berlin have watched and listened warily as president macron has since his 2017 election continued to push the concept of european strategic autonomy which seems to have evolved into an argument for a kind of european security architecture independent from nato what's his vision why isn't nato enough and is this even realistic it is absolutely not that Kimberley. it is it, it doesn't mean independence for nato we are not uh, completely irrealistic we know that our uh, our problem with nato was more that nato was weakened by some behaviors uh, the lack of consultancy by the us but also when turkey invaded northeastern syria against the kurds which were our allies in, in our vital fight against terrorists. The terrorists who attacked France in 2015, in November 2015, plotted a terrible terrorist attacks from, from northeastern Syria. Here we have an ambition for NATO. We want this not to be any more possible. We want allies to consult and to agree on a common vision who are our enemies. So France in that case was, on, on the contrary, uh, uh, the country, the ally who said, we cannot continue like that. We must be stronger, being more consistent on our political visions. And our military are very active in all NATO projects. So we contribute to NATO interoperability. The concept our president use, is using is not so much uh, strategic autonomy. He developed another concept you can relate to the to this one which is european sovereignty what does mean european sovereignty it means because from the very beginning the european integration started by germany and france you know that it was a miracle after world war ii when our two nations out of three wars decided to to reconcile and we started to build europe on this idea that we must pool sovereignties. It was Jean Monnet's uh, idea to pool coal and steel resources and then to pool other resources and policies. This is the idea of European integration. To make Europe stronger, especially with new authoritarian countries, a new 
new powers who are again looking at a logic of uh, forces and, and we are not in, we are not interested like we democracies uh, to the same values we we need to make this european union stronger more sovereign and it is in the interest of the united states it is in the interest of the alliance i uh, i think that tony blinken said something quite right when it was the first time in brussels he said we the alliance will become stronger if the members of the alliance become stronger so we want to reinforce to adapt nato but it will only benefit on the us also and our common security if your european allies are stronger themselves and for instance uh, if the us in our direct neighborhood like middle east or africa is not willing to engage its troops to, to have boots on the ground, as you say. Better to have an ally who, who can do that, as we do in, in Africa, for instance, to help uh, Sahel African countries to fight against terrorism. There, there is no American soldiers. We get a very, very valuable American support, intelligence, transport, and so on. But the boots on the ground and the soldiers who lose or risk losing their lives, and some of them have lost their lives, men and women soldiers, are French. So it is what we mean by uh, uh, European sovereignty. Some some others uh, we also use uh, the, the term strategic autonomy uh, also, but no, we are not the only ones in Europe who mention that, frankly. And it means to be more, to be stronger. I will give you one example. It is not only about security. Years ago, France was the one who said we must screen strategic investments. It was well before we spoke about 5G. And we, we said we cannot accept foreign powers who, who do not share uh, necessarily our interests or even our values to be able to invest uh, uh, without we, uh, us looking at what, uh, what they aim at. Frankly, it is what we mean to have more reciprocity with, uh, with China, for instance, and uh, to, be, to be able to more control what we do in the interest of our middle classes and our people. This is what we mean when we speak about European sovereignty. And I'm deeply convinced it is in the interest of the United States. Well, thank you. It sounds more complimentary than autonomous, perhaps. Um, I think the only, I only have time for one more question. And I, I want to turn to something that I think is a really interesting debate in France right now. Um, and going back to your talking about terrorist attacks in 2015, over 250 people have died in terror attacks in France since that year. Uh, and in November of last year, President Macron gave an interview to New York Times media journalist Ben Smith, in which he complained about criticism of France from the Anglo-American press in the wake of a number of attacks that began last October with the beheading of school teacher Samuel Paty, who in teaching about free speech had shown his class the infamous Charlie Hebdo cartoons mocking the prophet Muhammad. Macron told Smith, uh, the journalist, he objected to the criticism that France's racism and Islamophobia caused the violence. He accused the Anglo-American press of legitimizing violence and of not understanding the fundamental cultural principle in France of laicité translated as secularism, wherein the rules of being a citizen of the Republic override religious customs and rules. And in February, Macron and the National Assembly passed the so-called anti-separatism law, which bans or restricts many inherently Islamic religious practices that are believed to lead to radicalization. Quite a contrast to the anti-colonial woke movement here in America. So I'm wondering if you can talk about Les Cité and, and how it's different and why it's such a big part of the debate in France right now and the fact that the government is taking a more security driven approach to, um, you know, in its efforts to lead to fewer attacks and a more unified, peaceful society. And is this at all related to the upcoming presidential election next spring? since uh, Macron's biggest challenger will be the far right's Marie Le Pen. So I, I packed quite a few questions in there. But um, I think that this audience would find fascinating this, this, the differences between Les Cités and what 
yeah, how so, America's culture. You no, know, Kimberles, thank you for this series of great questions. My problem is that I would need 20 minutes to to answer all of this. Yeah, you have five. <laughs> um, in the short term, uh, there was a short term effect, a shock effect. The way some some uh, very very uh, well known and respected uh, newspapers in the U.S. covered Samuel Paty's murder, one one of them, uh, but took took away the title. But the first the first title he gave to the, his article was, "The police in Paris kills killed a Muslim on the streets. The police kills killed a, a Muslim on the street of Paris." It was a title. To give to, to to give an account of the murder of the teacher, you, can you, Kimberly, can you understand the reactions in France? You can, I am sure. I mean, the Muslim was a murderer who had killed and beheaded the teacher on the streets, indeed. So uh, there was a feeling of not being understood, not by the U.S., not at all by the U.S. or the U U.S. citizens in general, but by some some. A small number of commentators, but precisely maybe in this in this part of the society, uh, which is maybe the closest to us in a way, which uh, which uh, follows with interest. And I think here and now I, I enlarge the perspective. I think this is a, one of the reasons why there is this discussion, because my feeling, but maybe I'm wrong. It's a personal feeling, is that there is such a passion and interest between the two countries. That you you see what hap what you, you you consider a little what is happening in the other countries as a part of your own uh, uh, country, and indeed we have the same values. We have the same values of tolerance, of freedom of speech, the same values of uh, freedom of religion, but we are not exactly the same societies. We have not exactly the same histories. We are somewhat different, and we have also to take this difference into account. Look at the freedom of speech, for instance. You re, you tell yourself, you, you you reminded us yourself, Kimberly, that this teacher was beheaded because, not because he defended the caricatures, not at all. He tried to explain the concept of freedom of speech through this publishing of caricatures. And he was killed because of that. He was killed because he defended the freedom of speech. And the freedom of speech is a value which is so so much uh, so so important in the United States. And ironically, sometimes we are accused to suppress the freedom of speech while <laughs> it is at the origin of what we did. Secularism and laicite are very close. Well, I mean the American understanding of secularism and laicite, independence between church and state, freedom of religion. Laicite is the freedom for all religions, freedom to believe and not to believe in God. It's absolutely essential and we want to keep it. So this legislation, which is not anymore uh, and, um, under the title uh, Fight Against Separatism, but re it's about the, re the title is reinforce how, how to reinforce the implementation of the principles of our republic, we want to 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 fight against radicalism inside our society. We want to fight against everything which could bring from the outside, of course, but also from inside our society, radicalization uh, contrary to our values. For instance, to educate separately girls and boys. It can it can look and sound completely weird. But yes, there are people in our country, a very tiny part, the huge majority of the Muslim French citizens agree with that, with our policy. But there are still a small number of people which have this idea uh, to separate girls, not to give girls education. The, the, the thing we must fight everywhere in the world, not only in our societies. So it is about education, It's it's about many things but we we know kimberley that these issues of radicalization first we have also to fight outside and here i must really welcome the fact that the united states joined the so-called christ church call launched two years ago by new zealand and france against radicalization violent extremism on internet it is really important but we, we also recognize that we have our own issues inside france 
we, 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 you mentioned the yellow vest. We have equal problems of inequalities uh, in our society, inequalities in access to education, for instance. We have a, a lot of issues we have to also to solve, like you, like any other country. So we, we are not there only to say it's a problem of security, of, uh, but it, there is a huge dimension of security, but we recognize there are a number of other issues. Finally, of course, the campaign last, next year in France, the political elections will be about the main topics of the society. And this is a, a huge topic for all French citizens, and it is understandable. But we have to do this anyway, elections or not. It is something which has to be uh, uh, tackled. Thank you. That Thank you for that, that that full answer. And also, I I actually hear the passion in your voice on this one because I know that it hits home for for most French people. Yes, um, I was a, I was ambassador here in Washington in the U.S. while all this happened. So I tried yeah. to to publish uh, 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 edits in uh, ed, uh, you know comments in the press. I I, I I worked with a lot of people who are still doing that because we try to explain. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it, and, it, and it's important for us to understand as well. Um, I'd like to ask, I think I'm going to welcome Jessica back um, to our group. And she's now going to lead uh, the asking of questions from our, our audience. So I'm, I've enjoyed mine and I'll come back on at the end. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, Ambassador, the first question and uh, Forgive my pronunciation. Bonjour, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, et je vous remercie de votre service à la France et aux États-Unis. France is our oldest and, with some bias, I would say our most precious ally. Military partnership between our nations is very important, as is our existing diplomatic and commercial collaborations. Do you have any additional comments you could make on the strategic partnership between our two armed forces? Perhaps American and French activity towards stability in the EU and the Middle East, or, for example, countering Russian and Chinese aggression. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for the very good French uh, <laughs> you you spoke with. I, indeed, since we are the oldest ally in terms of uh, alliance, coming back to the independence war in the United States, we, are also, we have also developed a very strong military cooperation. And um, I mentioned the, 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 the fight against terrorists which is maybe now a little behind the competition between big powers in the in the U.S. policy, which is uh, understandable, but uh, it remains a very important aspect of our cooperation on all levels, intelligence also, and uh, uh, and political consultations, but in particular military cooperation. And the best place to see that is, as I said, is Sahel, where, but also Levant, Syria, Iraq, where we try to really um, to minimize the effort which the U.S. is uh, still obliged to, to provide, not only by showing that our own military are able to take risks, but also have uh, by developing our own capacities. Our military budget has been increased a lot in the last years, and also by bringing other, and especially European Union member states. And finally, because I think it is essential, of by showing that we, we we are uh, operational. We 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 can uh, handle together what we call the three Ds: uh, defense, but also diplomacy and development. And Africa is a very good field on our, our continent to see that, because we will not support efficiently those African nations to fight for their security if we just uh, uh, support them uh, in a short-term military uh, effort. And I think that here, the US and France, especially with the new administration, have much to, to, to work together on. Uh, this complementarity between uh, this military action, but also the development action. This is really important. And finally, since you mentioned Russia and China, uh, which obviously two very, very important uh, security challenges, we are, as NATO member, we are very active in, um, we are, for instance, in Estonia with the uh, United Kingdom and alternatively with Germany and Lithuania in the uh, forward and hence forward present NATO policy. And we are more and more present in the Indo-Pacific. We are the first European country who has 
develop its own Indo-Pacific strategy because we have territories both in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean, small territories, but we have still 1.52 million people living there in, in those uh, regions, far from uh, the French um, metropole, but we, we have still also, we have also military assets there. And we have shown recently that we use them in uh, in uh, in exercise, uh, in uh, in uh, in cooperation with uh, with the U.S. and other strategic allies in this region. Thank you. How how do French citizens view America's struggle with race relations and homegrown terrorism? Well, first, uh, on, on the first issue, uh, the George Floyd, George Floyd's murder and the, the, all the social movement uh, which followed and the BLM movement have been followed in France, like in other countries in the world, in, in Europe, with a huge interest uh, and, of course, lack for laicity and uh, uh, secularism. We feel also, uh, we have also issues of uh, tolerance of equalities, so uh, we are we, we followed this we, both because the, the U.S. is uh, is very much uh, so important for us uh, as a as a as a very close friend, but also as a, the, the the most powerful democracy in the world. So we we follow this from this point of view, but also lo looking at our own uh, our own challenges. The same on the sixth of January. The same on the sixth of January because we were all shocked when uh, we, we were looking what was developing on the Capitol Hill on that day. I remember our president uh, took the floor in the night to, and he, he made a, something in English to support the, the idea of democracy in the United States. He mentioned uh, Tocqueville. We, we were completely uh, shocked, but on the other end, again here, we didn't see this only as a something happening in the US uh, only we we considered it also as having relevance for us uh, because it shows how fragile our democracies are. And uh, Kimberley mentioned the Yellow Vest movement in in France two 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 years ago. And frankly, some scenes we have seen uh, in January here in Washington reminded me of some scenes we had seen in Paris uh, with the, uh, during the Yellow Vest movement. So to understand where it comes from, where this frustration comes from. Also, again, it's a question sometimes of inequalities, of uh, the feeling to, this feeling to be abandoned, but also the necessity to fight, to fight decisively against, uh, including on the internet, uh, uh, against uh, violent extremism, radicalism, and terrorism, be it homegrown or uh, uh, foreign. And the Christchurch call, which was launched two years ago by the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the French President, followed the terrorist attacks in Christchurch, which was more or less homegrown terrorism. Even the, in the at, at, uh, the terrorist was not from New Zealand, but it, it was an attack against most two mosques in in the, the town of Christchurch. So this is a common this is this is a common fight, homegrown and uh, external terrorism because it goes through the same channels, including uh, internet and the social media. The French government has opposed the wearing of the hijab in society while making exceptions for the wearing of habits by nuns. What is the justification for such exceptions to laïcité? What exception? What about nuns? Um, that uh, women, that it's, they deny or they don't want people wearing the hijab, but they make exceptions for nuns who wear a habit. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. I should know because I actually have a sister, a sister who is a nun in a Dominican monastery. But uh, I think that it's really important that secularism or laicite is applied to all uh, all uh, religions. We had issues with other communities, with uh, Sikh communities, and I can tell you that Christians also feel at some time very strongly against some implementation of this laicite. I remember stories, polemic. Pole uh, discussions about uh, Christmas, how do, you, how do you say, when you put the small house where with Jesus and the Like cradle. the nativity or the crash, yeah. Yes, the crash, exactly, crash. Uh, in town halls or uh, students having a cross. Uh, in, so you cannot imagine the number of issues where the Christians were 
considered in, uh, in a way um, not fairly treated by the implementation of uh, laicite. So it's 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 applied to all religion all religions. Your question implies that there is a one at least one instance where it is not the case. I cannot tell you because uh, I don't I didn't know that, but uh, I will check. <laughs> Thank you. There, uh, must be, there, there must be an explanation, uh, but uh, I have not it with me. Maybe it's a vocation versus versus the public. I don't know. Um, President Macron has said that the EU needs to find ways to engage with Russia. What does that mean in reality? In reality, it means what you are doing yourself as in the US. It's exactly, well, as I see it, uh, not exactly, but it's kind of the, this uh, uh, US administration saying very firmly, there are behaviors we will not accept from the Russians, from the Russian leadership, for the, uh, but we are, uh, we want to engage to have a stable, predictable relation with Russia, and for this, we we we, we consider we have to to speak with, with the Russians. It's exactly what we 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 said, um, what President Macron said in July 2019 when he received uh, Vladimir Putin, President Putin, in the south of France just before the G7 summit in Biarritz, and um, we have been criticized uh, as being too up too open. But we we were very firm when, uh, as a EU member state or as France during um, uh, you, you remember there was this interference in our elections back in 2017 we had also cyber attacks we had uh, the use of chemical weapons uh, in the uk when the uk was still a, UK, a member of the eu uh, in salisbury and then uh, the navalny we every time and I, of course after crimea and eastern ukraine we reacted we we put sanctions we were very firm but on the other end we said we have to talk to the russians because on iran on uh, syria on uh, libya on korea north korea and on so many questions anyway we need to uh, on on st strategic stability arms control we need to talk with the russians and it is especially true for the europeans if it is true for the americans it is still more valid for the europeans because russia is our neighbor and it will stay our neighbor how will President Macron address the rise of right-wing extremism in France, evinced by the recent letter from members of the military talking about the breakdown of French society? Well, there was a, a clear reaction by the chief of chief of staff uh, of the army, or um, uh, the the head of the army, the military head of the army. General Lecointre, and uh, by ministers uh, who took measures. We have a principle, absolutely essential principle in in our country which is that the military must be neutral by the way the civil service also but the military is obviously very important so those uh, those tribunes were um, obviously unacceptable from this point of view and uh, they have uh, taken measures against this thank you um, uh, will american tourists oh, sorry go ahead maybe i did not answer the question uh, but uh, did I, did I Sorry, we... <laughs> Thank you. Um, what does the ambassador see as the world's most dangerous flashpoint? Here in the US, oftentimes people point to the Korean Peninsula, but perhaps the purview is different from his perch in Europe. Uh, we think that terrorism is, remains after the, the trauma of the attacks in 2015 and uh, after the um, renewed terrorist attacks last year remains a, a, a critical danger for our societies. But we also consider that non-proliferation uh, uh, is absolutely crucial for our collective security. This is the reason why we are very much active on the Iran TCPOA uh, dossier. And although North Korea is a bit further from us, it's the same. It's uh, considering uh, the systems which uh, North Korea is, uh, is known to have developed uh, or to have tested. Uh, it's uh, it's a problem for international security in general and uh, not only for the regional partners. So France has always been very strong on non-proliferation and on the TNP treaty on non-proliferation. And um, so I would say that those two issues, um, terrorism and non-proliferation are really important. But there are many others related to the development of new technologies artificial intelligence, 
uh, all of this uh, space, the development, incredible development of, of space policies. So in each of these new developments, we have also big security challenges. You, you were about to ask a question about tourism. Yes, that too. So we had two questions. Uh, when will France allow visitors from the United States um, and will the tourists need to be vaccinated or with a negative PCR test? Will a health pass be mandatory or will it be as an app? Um, first, uh, I ask, I, I thank you uh, for this question because two days is a great day in France because we reopen uh, restaurants, museums, theaters today. It's a uh, it's uh, very important, so <laughs> I'm happy to be with you. Uh, second, we, we, we announced that we, would, uh, wa we wanted to reopen on, on the 9th of June, to, even to uh, tourists from uh, the US or other countries, pending some technical um, work uh, indeed on, for instance, how to prove you have been vaccinated when you come from a third country, third related in relation with the EU, because in the EU we are now developing a, a, a common system of a COVID vaccination certificate. So, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm happy, uh, I, I hope really that uh, we will reopen in June to, to, uh, to tourism from America, and I hope that the US also will reopen to our, uh, to our uh, not only students and teachers, because uh, we have been working since last year already on this, but also to, to our business communities and to, to our tourists and citizens. Even people living in the US, but when they are in Paris or in France, they are not allowed back into the US, you know, right now. It's it's terrible. So we, we hope to have a, uh, all this uh, mutual opening uh, happening soon. Uh, all the more we have now vaccinations. France is, and like Germany or other European countries are vaccinating very, very quickly. We are at more than 500,000 doses every day right now. So which is, which, which would be more than 3 million doses in the US. So uh, it's, uh, we are at 40% of our population vaccinated for a first shot, 40% of the adults. It goes very quickly. So being vaccinated so, so much, we should now focus on vac helping vaccination all over the world, but between ourselves, um, uh, between US and Europe, we should try to reopen as soon as possible. Wonderful. Well, I, I know we're almost at the end of the hour and I wanna invite Kimberly back in case she has any final questions before we wrap up. Um, just, uh, will you be in France in July when I come there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will be in August. Kimberly, uh, be... yeah, of course. August yeah. is the big vacation month, but that was actually great news as I was sitting there. And I just want to thank you, Ambassador Etienne, for all of your uh, really thoughtful answers. Uh, you know, you're you really, uh, you know, very open-minded and willing to accept our somewhat challenging questions um, with with. A very frank uh, answers and approach. Um, it's clearly indicative of why uh, you've had such an illustrious career. So I uh, really appreciate you taking the time and then also want to just say another big thank you to Jessica and her team at the World Affairs Council for, for hosting this and I'm, I'm hoping we can do this again. Um, when, do, when do you actually, uh, when, do you, when is your post ending? What time, when do you, when is that done? You mean how long will, will yes, I remember? How long are, will you be at, be ambassador to the U.S.? It depends on my government and the, the pre, my president. So you should ask them. But uh, I, I am not uh, anymore a young diplomat, Kimberley. So I <laughs> guess I have still maybe one one and a half years, uh, maybe, because then I reach uh, the age uh, which uh, leads to. Uh, Happy, hopefully happy retirement. But uh, uh, up to then, it's de it will depend uh, on somebody else, uh, not on me. But I am so happy to be here, and we'll be so happy to visit you again, uh, both Northern and Southern California. And uh, yes, look we, forward to we, it. You must, yeah. Let us know. And all right, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jessica, to close us out. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. This is a, a wonderful conversation, and I agree, Kimberly. We need to get Ambassador Etienne out to Los Angeles and hopefully host uh, this event in person um, when we can all, all enjoy some French and California wine together. 
So thank you both so much. Um, and for our audience, if you are wanting more French programming, we'll be hosting a talk in exactly two weeks from today on the restoration of Notre Dame with Michel Picot, who is the president of the Friends of Notre Dame and Professor mm -hmm. Stephen Murray, who is an expert on Gothic architecture. So I think the embassy hosted an event with both of them a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. So uh, we'll be doing kind of a, our own version of that. So thank you again so much for helping to make that event possible. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Kimberly. All the best. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.